record. So uh, we'll record the, the session as well. I'll give it to a minute past and then I think probably would start and expect people to just catch up. Here we go. No, they're coming through. Right, um, as, our, as our delegate guests start winding their way into the, the lightning poster session, I think we should kick off. So as we've got quite a lot to, to cover and I, I'm, I think it's gonna be yeah, really interesting. We want to hear it all. So can I first welcome Tracy Teal, um, who's going to talk about data publishing for researchers. Thank you, Tracy. Hello, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm glad to be, I'm a first time attendee of this conference, so I'm glad that I could uh, participate. Um, so yes, I'm gonna be talking today about data publishing for researchers um, for the organization Dryad, where I'm the executive director. Um, so our vision at Dryad is to promote a world where research data is openly available, integrated with the scholarly literature, and routinely reused to create knowledge. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization, uh, community governed. Uh, so Fiona is actually one of our board members. Um, so we're very community based, um, as well as being very interested and invested in data sharing and reuse. Uh, we are a curated generalist repository. So this means that uh, we take data from all different domains of research um, and we curate all of the data sets that come through. So anyone who's sharing data with us, um, we look at each data set before we publish it. Um, and so what's great to see is we were founded in 2010 um, and over the last 10 years, we've seen uh, increasing interest and in deposits of data in the repository, reflecting the overall shifts around data publishing and data sharing. Uh, and so this set of data sets represents more than 100,000 researchers uh, for 36,000 data publications over 2,100 international institutions, um, data sets associated with more than 1,200 journals. Uh, and then we have um, member and publishers, uh, publisher and institutional members uh, supporting uh, Dryad and researchers uh, publishing their data through Dryad. So one of the things that we're really focused on is community, community standards and integrating those uh, into our platform. Uh, so within the Dryad platform, we use ORCID. So everybody logs in with ORCID, um, connect these uh, data publications with your ORCID ID. Um, we also use ROAR, which is like an institutional ORCID um, for affiliations. Um, and uh, we also work with the Make Data Count project. Uh, the lead on that, Daniela Lowenberg, is also the Dryad product manager um, to be able to show um, how the data is being viewed, downloaded, um, and cited. The other thing that's really key is that making this process really easy for researchers. Um, we know that it's not necessarily yet a part of everyone's workflow, and so we, we want to remove barriers uh, to data publication. Um, so a researcher starts out um, and describe the data set. So uh, lots of times the data set is associated with the manuscript, um, but it also doesn't need to be. So there's a lot of different ways and at different points in the research uh, data lifecycle that people can publish their data. Uh, then you can go and you can upload up to 300 gigabytes. Um, and so you can do this either from your computer or you can enter the URL. So if it's on um, in Dropbox or something like that, you can enter the URL and upload from there. Um, and so we ask for this um, information about the data, the metadata through that, as well as those file uploads. Um, the other thing that we're very invested in are integrations and partnerships. So we 
um, as a nonprofit organization, we really want to leverage and work with like-minded um, organizations in the space. Uh, so one that we recently uh, launched an integration with, with Zenodo. Um, and so here at this page where you describe the data set, you upload the data. There's also now uh, another tab to upload software. Um, and that software will actually be uh, stored at Zenodo uh, and be able to have the appropriate software licenses. Uh, Zodo real, has a real strength uh, in the software space. And so we've made that uh, very easy for people to come to Dryad, but then be able to separate out their different research products. The other key is publisher integrations. Uh, we know that the time that people are publishing their data is at the time of a manuscript submission. Uh, so we integrate with different uh, publishers. So uh, the e-journal press is going to be launching an integration shortly, editorial manager uh, later this year. We already have other integrations, um, but as we do those more um, at an individual journal level, this is going to allow us to have an integration across many different journals um, all through these different submission systems. And so that's when the researcher is submitting the manuscript, they also can be asked, do you want to share your data and not even need to leave that um, well, the, they'll be directed to Dryad from that platform, um, so I'll be a part of that same process. Finally, um, we also do workflow integrations. So this is all that was about the submission of data, um, but a key is for it to be available and reused. Uh, so there's our OpenSci package that works with Dryad, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, Binder, Protocols.io, um, so options for researchers to reuse the data. And we also just are starting an initiative with the Open Knowledge Foundation and Frictionless Data. Um, they have a good tables uh, product that checks uh, for tabular data. So it'll be able to look before our curators even look at it and increase the quality of tabular data, which is a significant amount of the data that comes to Dryad. So uh, that's just a little bit about us. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, joining us, um, we do have a webinar coming up uh, March 4th on Dryad and the Zenodo integration. Um, you can publish your data. Uh, or if you're interested in membership and supporting uh, data publishing for your institution or your journals, um, a little bit of information there. But always feel free to get in touch with us. I'm director at datadryad.org or uh, help at datadryad.org, we're always happy to talk with you. So I had a, I did have a question to pose at the end uh, and also take any questions uh, from anyone who has them. Um, but one of the things we've really seen is increase in data, but uh, it's not consistent across all domains of research. So I would be interested in hearing from you or about ideas you have to drive adoption of data publishing and sharing and reuse uh, in your community, if you have any ideas there or want to ask any questions about um, how we've seen that uh, change over time. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and take any questions. Okay, it usually takes a moment or so for people to, um, to get their questions to actually come through. Um, I think in, in to kick off though, um, I was just thinking that, that um, you you are very keen. You know, you, you talk about you know, integrations and partnerships and things. I mean, is there a, any sort of potential partnership that's either too big or too small? Do you think for Dryad? Um, are you are you interested in in working with anybody, everybody, or is there a particular group of um, like an industry um, area or, or a subject area or anything that you're particularly interested in? No, I don't think in, in terms of too big or too small, I, I don't think it's about the size. It's more about like the, the like-mindedness, the approach to the work. So we're very committed to um, open infrastructure and sustainability. Um, and so we like to have partner with organizations that have a similar um, mindset and connection with the community. Two areas um, where I think we're, we're really interested, preprints. Um, so we're talking, you know, trend with archive or bioarchive um, and connecting up uh, data publishing more with the preprint space. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that with the emergence of preprints during the pandemic. 
um, that that's been really important. Um, the other we're hearing about is sort of post-publication review of data sets. Um, so in the same way that people want to have conversations about uh, manuscripts um, that as data are primary research products, there could also be options around um, being able to comment, not necessarily on the Dryad platform, um, but uh, in other venues uh, to have conversations around the data. Yeah. Okay, well, well, thank you very much, um, Tracy. Um, Remember, everybody, there's plenty of opportunities to reach out and, and you know, to pick up any threads of this or any new questions you might have, either through the spatial chat and the conference software, or um, you could see that there, there's ways of getting in touch with her um, via the slides or also um, online, I'm sure, via, via Dryad itself. Thank you ever so much, Tracy. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, can we have now Zoe, Zoe Wake High? She's going to talk about the Rebus Foundation. Thank you, Zoe. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, great to be here with everybody. And I'll be chatting today about Rebus Inc, which is one of the key projects of the Rebus Foundation. We're a, a registered charity based here in Montreal. Um, and we have a mission to reimagine the publishing ecosystem on open principles. Uh, so Rebus Inc is one of our key projects in, in achieving that. Uh, so I'll start if I can move my slides forward. Very conveniently, you've allowed me to situate myself with this lovely logo for the conference. We fit in right here, right between reading and research. And the key question that we're really engaging with is how does reading turn into or lead to more research? Um, and, you know, I really enjoyed seeing that represented in, in this understanding of the, 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 the cycle of publishing um, because it's often left out. Uh, and that's really what we found through our own work. Um, so we really come at the question of, of what can we contribute to, to the research ecosystem from this position of thinking about what reading is. Uh, and through, through our research, which has been really focused on speaking with researchers, with librarians, publishers, aggregators, uh, everybody who we can, who we can get our hands on. Um, and we've really developed an understanding of reading in the research context as something that's a really active process. Uh, there's generally a purpose to the reading that's being done. It's much more complex than just consuming words on the page and in fact it might not even involve words uh, there, there's a, a much broader understanding of, um, uh, of sources out there <coughs> excuse me that one might use in their research so we think of reading as a purposeful generative creative act but we've also found it's really not well supported or well taught this is kind of invisibility or an assumption about it that it's something that people know how to do as part of their research um, but are, are, are kind of struggling in, in some ways to, to get the most out of it that they can. Um, so this is a couple of our key findings out of the research we've done. Uh, so more and more researchers are managing enormous collections of, uh, of content. I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. It's the you know million and one PDFs problem often. Um, and because digital content is very easy to collect now and, and retain, um, it feels like that's, that's a, a kind of a, a positive thing and it certainly has benefits, uh, but it's also increasing this feeling of overwhelm. In addition, the ways in which researchers are figuring out to manage this reading for research process, uh, they tend to be really improvised, kind of video, you know, often very idiosyncratic, just kind of they'll figure out something that works for them. There's a lot of chaos that gets cited um, and the tools available are generally not talking to each other. So it's quite disjointed. You might have content living in one place, your notes somewhere else, uh, and you could have three places for, for all of those, um, you know, to, to be found in, and, and they're not talking to each other well. And then critically as well, while this is a problem we found really across the spectrum in terms of research experience, junior researchers aren't really uh, brought along into understanding how to do this work very well. Um, you know, we've talked to a lot of people about their experience of research methods, uh, courses and things like that. And there's not a lot of dedicated attention given to establishing the kinds of systems that you need to do your reading effectively as part of your research. So in response, we are designing Rebusync, um, which is an open source research workflow tool. The open bit is really important to us. Happy to talk more about that uh, in the questions. And we also have a bit of a focus on arts, humanities, and social science researchers. That's not to say that there isn't been a value or, or benefits to, to other disciplines of using our tool. And in fact, I think they'll benefit from, uh, from it a lot. But there is something quite particular about the way these disciplines engage with their sources. Um, and uh, frankly, it's quite nice to give them some attention too, 
because a lot of what's out there uh, uh, in terms of research tools tends to just sort of assume that that uh, you know what, what's relevant for for science and the kind of STEM sense is going to be relevant for other disciplines, and that's not always the case. Um, and so really, you know, rather than being just an organizational system, it's about managing your sources for a purpose uh, and really helping with this drawing out insights or, or um, the sense making process of research. And not that we think a tool can replace it, but it can help to structure it and give some guidance where people are really struggling to kind of feel confident in the process that they're that they're building for themselves. So this is a sneak peek of it. Uh, the things, the key things you can do, you can create and organize your sources. You can upload them and read them in our platform, but you don't have to. If your source is already in your Google Drive or it's behind a paywall somewhere and you can't get it out, for whatever the reason, you can still create a record of all your sources here. Then you can create notes associated with those sources, either through our reading interface or we're also interested in integrations like uh, importing excuse me, uh, you know, an easy one is from, from Hypothesis, which is a web annotation platform. Um, we also then allow you to create notebooks. And this is where you can kind of focus in on a particular topic or project you're working on. And then we're developing tools to help you uh, draw connections between the notes that you've, that you've created, um, which should be loading here. So this is a preview of our outline tool. Um, so this is really kind of the final stage in, in the Rebusync workflow. You've created your sources, you've read them, you've created your notes on them, you've categorized those notes, you've put them into context with each other because you know they're all related to a particular project. And then here, this is very much a demo beta stage, um, you can put them into an outline and start creating uh, the outline for a piece of work, whether that's a journal article or a blog post or a podcast script, whatever it is that you're doing, you start, you, you can start kind of creating a context for, for the notes. Um, and you'll see it's, as I say, there's a little, uh, a little lag and whatnot, but it gives you some sense of being able to bring your notes together and, and um, create something new from them. Um, so given time, I might skip over this, but I'm happy to talk a bit more about the specifics of how we're addressing the challenges identified in our research. Um, and the really key thing I want to say is we've been building this based on a ton of user research, we've been testing it with people, and now we're kind of really close to having something we think is useful for people to go out and use in the world for real life. Uh, and that's where I'd really like to ask all of you, if you're interested in this concept, please uh, take note of this link. Um, if you give us a little information about yourself, we'll reach out to set up a testing session, because um, we've got to see this in real life, uh, we've got to see how it goes, and the only way to do that is to be um, putting it in front of researchers and then we also have a real focus on making sure that this is integrating well into the research ecosystem broadly particularly the open research and, um, ecosystem and so if you see potential connections or applications in the work that you're doing please 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 uh, get in touch I would really love to talk to you and um, yeah for, throw you at the platform and see how you can break it uh, great thanks so much I'll stop sharing and happy to answer any questions Thank you very much, Zoe. So um, I have had one through um, on direct message, I think, because the person mm -hmm. involved has got um, apparently very large construction, which I think could be heard even over <laughs> chat. Um, so um, it's will Rebus Inc. store digital sources like videos, or is it mostly print based? So we're taking a really broad definition of sources. Right now, we support PDF, EPUB, uh, copy paste, and docx and we're working on multimedia support likely that'll start with something like you know youtube embedding because that's a little easier from the technical perspective but being able to have video and image and audio in this space as well is is absolutely on the very very soon uh, very close roadmap in addition thinking about things like if you read a twitter thread and that's what's interesting and inspirational to you why shouldn't you capture it here? Capture it here as well. We all know that the the, the reading we do for research is much wider than books and journal articles, um, and so we're really trying to lean into that and and uh, make sure that we're, we're we're capturing that in a way that is that's um, you know reflecting the reality of research. Okay, um, and I actually I've got another question as well. I've got an, an eye on the time because, as I say, Mark yes. will throw us all out at at half past, and we need to speak to Vincent. Um, but I'm um, thinking about reading and thinking about different languages as well. I mean, how, how, do, how do you work with different languages or different language speakers? 
Right. Yeah. Right now, we've, um, you know, given the scale of our project, we're funded by the Mellon Foundation and we have a very small team. We we have prioritized English language right now. We're based in Quebec, so French language is going to be next because that's kind of we have access to resources and partners we can work with that on. Um, this won't be successful unless it is also useful for more than just English and French, right? Um, it's a big undertaking. It's one we're committed to in principle. In practice, right now, we have some some limitations on, on being able to move forward on that. But if someone wants to get involved and help us do it, I uh, would absolutely love to hear that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Zoe. I think it sounds like it's really good timing for you to be able to present here. And hopefully absolutely. people will, will you'll get some sign-ups from this session. Thank you so much. Yep. All right, so um, Vincent, last but very much not least. Hi, I'll just switch my screens there for everybody to see. Is that working? Yes. So, that, great. So thank you very much. And um, let's hear about Going for Gold. So well, first of all, uh, hi, everybody. And thanks for the invitation to come and speak to you. Um, we are the, the IET, the Institution of Engineering Technology. We're a um, fairly, uh, if I can say standard, learned professional society. So about 160,000 members in 54 countries, offices in the US, China, Hong Kong, and as you can see, over In January, we did something really profound um, with our, with our journal publishing. So what I want to share with you today is and it has several elements that make it uh, of great significance, I think. One is that we flipped the entire journal program to gold open access. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, the, the, most, the drivers behind that and our, our, um, our strategies. And then secondly, after well over 100 years of self-publishing, we went into partnership with uh, John Wiley to do this. And uh, I'll make some observations about that too. So, um, I guess the the uh, the first point I want to make is so why is open access important to the IET? Um, we had been investing heavily in open access over the previous of uh, uh, five to seven years, launching uh, gold open access journals to supplement our existing portfolio of around twenty eight uh, hybrid journals. Um, during that period, we had begun to acknowledge that the gold OA launches, even though they were somewhat, uh, obviously, obviously they were newer uh, publications, were getting very good, um, and in, in fact, uh, better in some cases impact for our authors and improved access. So the flip to gold was an acknowledgement that we would drive impact for our authors. Uh, the organization, the IT, has a number of facets, membership, alongside membership and knowledge transfer publishing, it has a policy division. And it, it also increasingly became important for us to, to become aligned from a policy funding point of view with those organizations and those governments that are funding the kind of research that supports uh, engineering sciences. And so there was a strategic reason for the, the adoption of gold open access. And of course, taking the long-term view, we do believe that, that um, open access over time will become the predominant uh, and a sustainable business model. And also significantly open access for us is, a, is part of the, the journey towards us embracing open research across all of our um, activities. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. So why transition the whole portfolio to OA at this time? So as an organization that undertakes many activities, um, both as I say, membership and policy and publishing, this was a way of us demonstrating publishing, not just as part of the financial sustainability of the institution, but pulling publishing in as part of our mission we, our Royal Charter talks about knowledge transfer, and so in em embracing the open act, the, the, the um, philosophy and the ethics around open research and open access clearly pulls the publishing into 
um, the mission of a not-for-profit organization. Um, it gives us the opportunity to shape the policy, the debate around policy, and not to be an observer, but to be an active participant. So to be, if I might put it on the right side of the historical changes. And as I said earlier on, the OA transformation is only part of, an, of a move towards open research. And we are fortunate that we have other tools and services that support the research workflow. So we have an abstract and indexing service. We have a, um, an analytics tool. We have a TV capability, books and others, events. And we're, we are constructing an open research proposition. And it was really quite difficult for us to fully embrace that without embracing open access as a business model. But after, after um, over 100 years of self-publishing, almost as profound uh, and um, significant a decision to move the business model of the journals was to move to partnership with another party and, and to forge a new kind of strategic partnership. And so I guess the question is, why did we choose Wiley? Um, firstly, the reach and scale of an organization of Wiley's uh, size was significant in allowing us to feel comfortable about the transition. It was important for us that we are partnering with organizations with ambition around the open research proposition. And so clearly Wiley has a leadership position, certainly in read and publish deals and in, in, in open access. Also important is the history for us of Wiley's, what I would call the service ethic of supporting hundreds of societies, I think over 200 societies, um, and being able to embrace um, our ambitions within Wiley's ambitions. Um, and then I think finally getting that strategic alignment around partnership, I think this is quite significant for us all to acknowledge that as our the scholarly process of scholarly discourse changes, so do the relationships of the players. And I believe passionately that um, the new relationships will be, uh, or the future will be about connecting, um, and less about um, um, single players, but more about a network of players and a network of relationships. And this is what we're looking to achieve in our relationship with Wiley. So um, that's some of the theory behind it. So what have we done? Well, we've, in terms of managing the transition, we launched a 42, it's our portfolio of journals, new submission sites launched between September and October. We think that the first, we're the first society publisher to, to flip its entire journals portfolio. Um, we then launched in, um, a considerable effort to bring our editors in chief along without whom we would not have journal program. And they aren't our journals, they're the editors in chief's journals and we work on them together communicating with authors. And we launched, there's a little snapshot on the left here of a new hub that we launched. So it's not just we've flipped the business model, we've taken um, content, journal content around 50,000 articles between 2013 and 2020. And we've put, made those open um, to the world. And we have also uh, retained our um, archive behind a paywall. So I just wanted to give you a little snapshot about this has been a, a, a significant undertaking across the whole of the organization, as I say, a profound undertaking um, involving all elements of the organization, all elements of the publishing process. So how have we done? Six weeks, our progress checklist is we have seen a dramatic increase in usage um, uh, by uh, 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 around 50% increased usage in the first six weeks of the year. We have anticipated a drop in submission and I have a little question mark over that because it's, we are still working our way through the significance of that and our response to it. We have had great support from the editors in chief and all of our boards are around 3000 members of our editor editorial boards, but this requires constant 
management, constant support, constant communication in order to make sure that we bring everyone along with us on the journey. We've had great support from the library community, which is an affirmation of our decision. And we are seeing strong foundations uh, of the partnership with Wiley as we begin to engage. We are a significant publisher in our own right, not, with, not without the journals and our books program and our inspect database. And we are beginning to understand how we work together with Wiley. And that's a very exciting, um, very rewarding experience. So that was my uh, little presentation. We've done this because open access improves impact. And we think open access, open research will allow us to engineer better change. I'll take any questions. Thanks. Yeah, actually, um, I think unfortunately we've got to the end of the session, ah. and uh, we do need people to um, be able to you know, get back and and, and hit the, hear the debate. I would like to say though that people, um, if you do have any any questions for for Vincent and as for any other people, that, um, Tracy or, or Zoe, we haven't been able to um, get to in this session. Please just reach out to them. We've got sort of email addresses. We've got the um, Twitter hashtag. We've got the you know the on air and spatial chat. Um, so just to leave it up, up to me now to um, say thanks ever so much for um, you know presenters and for you know contributors um, delegates for for sharing this this session and making it so interesting and um, hopefully we'll see quite a few of you tomorrow for um, you know either repeat performance of these people or um, or some of the other sessions as well because we've got we've got some really good um, posters that um, people will be presenting again tomorrow and if you go back to the main platform as you can see in chat um, it's the debate on paid peer review next which i think is going to be quite interesting particularly given some of the discussions that have already been, been had today about kind of access diversity gatekeeping and so forth um, at this conference so see you in there thank you <laughs>